My name is Rob Malcolm. I'm a math teacher from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. A green space sounds delightful, but math isn't just for the classroom. It's truly all around you. And you'll see just how useful math can be in the real world. Any question of how to improve something has to start with an observation. In order to fix the blight that's in our neighborhoods, we have to first see that it's there. Before we ask what effect green spaces could have on our mental and physical health, we have to see the need for improved mental and physical health. Math helps us to do that. My town, Johnstown, has a land area of about six square miles and a population of 20,000 people, but it wasn't always that size. As we learned in the social studies lesson, Johnstown's population reached its peak in 1920 with a population of about 67,000. The geographic size of the city hasn't changed much at all since then. However, around 1940, jobs started to leave the region, which meant people started to leave the region too. It's sometimes helpful to look at a statistic called population density, which refers to the number of people in a given space. In science, density is the amount of matter per unit of volume, or how much stuff you have in a given space. The formula to calculate density is mass divided by volume. And we can use area instead of volume to determine population density. A decreasing population density may help convince city leaders that there is room for more green space in our city. Reporting the population then and now shows where we are compared to where we've been. But we can also give an idea of where we're heading by using a scatter plot. A scatter plot is a plot of paired quantitative data where each data point is plotted as a single point. In this case, our paired data are year and population density. We can plot the population density from 1940 to 2010 and see how empty spaces have emerged in our city. And we can think about what the population may look like in the future. And that's all very helpful data to justify your proposal for a green space in your community. So we know that space exists in our community, and now we have to figure out how to utilize that space. And once again, math is the tool for that task. You pick a location and you start designing, but then the thought comes to mind, how can I best utilize the space given constraints to money and materials? We might want to start by looking at what shapes maximize a given area. Calculus, and optimization in particular, is a field of mathematics that makes it easy to figure out which shapes best utilize a space. But that branch of mathematics is probably above many of you, but that's okay. We'll look at it systematically, using geometry instead. You might have some preconceived notions about shapes and space, given a constraint such as perimeter, but we can use mathematical modeling to firm up those suspicions. How does the area of a quadrilateral compare to a triangle with the same perimeter? How about a pentagon? Well, let's see. You can do this type of mathematical modeling using identical cardboard strips. The cardboard strips are the same size, so the shapes will have the same perimeter and height. But now you can start to experiment with different shapes and see which one fits best in the space that you have. Since we're designing a green space, let's think about a specific use for one of these shapes. Let's say we want to make a ball pit and we want to determine which shape would be the best choice for that. I'll use a triangle and a square or rectangle as an example. Now, we're not only thinking about fitting the shape in the space, we also have to think about the volume because we need to know how many colored balls we have to buy to fill the pit. Volume is about the amount of space inside a three-dimensional shape. We know that the formula to calculate volume of any box is the area of its base times its height. In geometry, base area is the solid bottom of the object. And here's where we need to understand that volume is three-dimensional and base area is two-dimensional. Because they have different base areas, the volume of each shape will be different. And if the volume is different, the number of balls you need to fill each box will be different. The box that holds fewer balls has to have a larger base area because the base area and the height of the boxes are inversely proportional. Inversely proportional quantities change in inverse ways. 
For a given volume, if the base area is larger, then the height must be smaller. Conversely, if the height is larger, then the base area must be smaller. The same systematic geometric experiment will give us those answers. Try it and see what you find. Now that we've got an idea about optimal shapes, you've got to lay out your proposal in a visual that shows what you want to do. However, your design may be spectacular, but it might cost a little bit more money than you have in your budget. Math is how you budget your money to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck. Now maybe you haven't ever shopped for durable playground services or checked out the installation cost for a commercial swing set, but you probably have gone to a grocery store at some point in your life and the math you use to make decisions there also applies here. Suppose you want to buy some super fruity marshmallow crispy crunch. It comes in three sizes, normal, which is 10 ounces, family size at 20 ounces, and lifetime supply, which is 10 pounds. These boxes cost $2, $3, and $10 respectively. Those prices help us define the unit price, that is the cost to buy one unit of a particular product. A consideration like unit price can help you to make your decision. Let's break it down. The cereal comes out to six cents per ounce. At that price, the lifetime supply does give you the most bang for your buck. But what if you live in a tiny one bedroom apartment? Where would you store a lifetime supply of super fruity marshmallow crispy crunch? So unit price gives you some information to make your decision, but you have to take other factors into consideration too before you decide what to buy. That's exactly how it will work when you design and budget your green space. Math can help you quantify all of the factors, and then you can make informed decisions about what you need, what you can do, and what you should do. And I can't wait to see how you use math to help you make decisions that maximize your space and your budget. Good luck and have fun. To download the free lesson plans to be used with this program, visit us online at wqed.org SOS. To request a hard copy of the lesson plans, please contact your local school district. Funding for this program is provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Education for Learning at Home.